Welcome back. Uh, I'm attorney Todd L. Levitt, and joining me is one of my best friends and often co-host, not only on YouTube, the radio, and podcasting, the handsome and talented attorney Michael Nichols, otherwise known as the Nick. How you doing, Mike? Hey, how are you, Todd? I'm doing really well. It's that uh, time of year, my favorite holiday, Halloween, so I'm getting in the spirit. Morgan and I went shopping today and found a few things. Before I put this guy in the yard, I thought I'd help him, you know, get ready for uh, this this season, his first when night we, in our new home. When we, it's, it's an awesome job, Morgan, on the Halloween decorations, because it is October 2023. I had to step up my game. I had nothing but house plants behind me and therefore Jen ran out and grabbed the pumpkin. Assist so from Jen. Pumpkin. So my game is weak in regards to Halloween today. Yeah, our house looks pretty good. Our house and our yard. We we had to take down some of the older really cool like we had a, a scarecrow on a stick, but he had a pumpkin for a head. Um he just got too old and so we had to retire him last year. This is He's not going to be the replacement, but he's going to be part of the replacement plan going forward. It's amazing how big the Halloween decorations are now. They are three stories high. Yeah. And that stuff's expensive. That Look stuff is so expensive. Yeah. Like that, all the skeletons. Oh. But hey, we are actual attorneys. I've been practicing uh, in the state of Michigan since 1994, uh, which doesn't make me any smarter or better than my co-host, Mike Nichols, who is the one of the smartest lawyers I know, if not the smartest lawyer I know, but you also practice with your wife, Wendy Nichols, in the state of Michigan, correct? Yes, and uh, 1999 was my admission year. This will be 25 years, uh, May 11th for me. And we both are big fans of the show Suits. This is part one of a probably a three, four part series. I finished all nine episodes. I got to stop touching my table. It keeps rocking. I finished uh, all nine uh, episodes or seasons, and you, you and Wendy are just on a, a handful at this time. Right, you know, right. right. We're we. J I think we're on season two. We just got. I think you suggested we watch it. How do you like it so far? Yeah, it's uh, it's a nice guilty pleasure. Some of it is kind of realistic, but a lot of it is just not the real <laughs> deal. But it's fun to yeah. it's fun to watch. <laughs> And we are both trial attorneys. So let's talk about some of the, we love it. I love Harvey, Lewis, Donna, Jessica, Mike. How realistic is it, my dear friend, attorney Mike Nichols, that an attorney, let's say the state of Michigan where we practice, could, because the premise of the show is where there's, an, where there's a young man, I don't want to give it away, but he works at a law firm and holds himself out as an attorney and all the partners are aware of that, correct? Yeah, I don't think this is a big state secret. We're not giving anything away. The main character passed the bar, but for other people. They hired him to take the bar exam for them. He never went to law school, even though he could have, and he's holding himself out as a first year associate. The guy's brilliant. So talk a little bit about what it takes to get into law school and to become a licensed attorney? It takes a lot of persistence and perseverance and you have to sacrifice. Four year undergraduate degree. Correct. Followed by what? The law school admissions test or law school aptitude test. I forget what LSAT stands for. What a crock. I mean, all these aptitude tests to gauge what type of law school, based on your undergrad GPA, you can right. or cannot get into? All the lawyers in suits are from Harvard for the most for the most part. Right, right. They're all that from Harvard. Only hired Harvard. Harvard lawyers. Yeah, there are there are no uh, characters in suits whose character went to the Thomas M. Cooley Law School. Look, here's what I say: It doesn't, it, irregardless of what state somebody goes to law school in, you still have to take the same test after law school. You still have to answer the same questions and pass that bar exam. So folks, in order to become an attorney, you have to go to an accredited four-year law school, take the LSAT, the law school aptitude test. And based on 
what, Mr. Nichols, my dear friend, Mike, your undergraduate GPA, some other factors, who knows what, and your LSAT score, there's a formula and that determines which law school you can get into, correct? Yeah, it's called like the law school aptitude index or something like that. And how do you feel about it, that? Test? It took um it took Wendy, I think she got through law school in two and a half years. At least that's what she claims. I, I buy it because she's got very little patience. I could see her cramming in, you know, extra classes throughout the the career, her law school career. Um, I did it because I went to night school at Cooley. So I did it in three years and two semesters. So just under four years. But typically a law school, they say, is three years. So after law school, you, you get a Juris Doctor degree, JD degree. Doesn't mean you go around calling yourself Dr. Nichols or Dr. Levitt, similar to a PhD or an MD. I think that's ridiculous. I actually know yeah. one or two attorneys, they're professors, and they require the students to call them doctor. I mean, that's such a crock. I mean, lawyers, there's so many lawyers who are so full of themselves out there. I'm sorry, lawyers. Yeah, yeah. Listen, Mike and I have earned the right to tell you that. And even if we yeah. weren't practicing as long as we have, what a crock. You know, those, those lawyers that get a Juris Doctor degree and put doctor on their business card are the same first year law students, hopefully this wasn't you, that came to class in a suit and a tie and a briefcase and had, didn't even have a job yet. I came, <laughs> when I came, my first year of law school, Mike, I was in a, a Central Michigan t-shirt because I went to Central Michigan University and a pair of sweatpants. I mean, I wasn't there to prove anything. I just wanted to get through it. So after, after law school, what type of test are you required to take? Oh, it's the bar exam. Oh my, the bar exam. I'll never forget the bar exam. Brutal. Yeah. My my <laughs> first wife, my first wife was very, very pregnant with our first child. So I had a big motivator. I couldn't, I had to, I had to feed my family. Hey, my daughter, who's a lawyer now, same thing. Okay. Hey, Rachel. Rachel. Yeah. Rachel. Yeah. Great lawyer. Yeah. But the, the, the bar exam is a two day test. And what we're saying folks is because I'm suits, the premise is Mike works at a big law firm, holds himself out to be a Harvard lawyer, never took the bar, but it doesn't matter where you go to law school. In fact, in all the decades I've been practicing, not one potential client ever sat down in my office and said, Todd, where'd you go to law school? That determines whether or not I'm going to hire you or not. I went to Detroit College of Law, which was down- Just now MSU, which is now the MSU. Michigan State University Law School. But so, don't, for, don't forget, don't, don't forget though, Todd, um, that bar exam, there is a, a third session, just most people take it when they're still in law school. It's on professional responsibility, also known as ethics. But they let you take it before you graduate. I'm so ancient. We didn't have to do that when I was taking the bar back in the early 1990s. Oh, wow. Okay. So the, the premise of the show, we're talking about it. What's the likelihood that somebody in any state in this great country of ours could hold him or herself out as a lawyer? I think it's, I'm not, we're not recommending anybody do this, but similar to suits, you could hire somebody, put a suit on them, send them to court. Who's no one ever says, where's your, let me see your law degree or ask you about law school. Right. I think, I mean, it is a crime to do that. It's a misdemeanor in Michigan to hold yourself out as an attorney. But how easy is that, Mike, in your opinion, similar to the show suits? You'd have to figure out a way to give yourself a P number or practice number that you could skate by and nobody would call you on it. Right. Um, but then if somebody were to look you up because the state bar has a website, they've got a list of all the, the lawyers who have valid, in other words, you know, in good, good standing. standing, in good standing. Right. Um, you'd have to figure that part out. I suppose it could be done until and unless somebody cross-checked your records at the state bar. I walk into courts once in a while that I've never been to. I mean, my P number, similar to yours, you know, in Michigan and other states, a P number is a, we have a five digit number here at 494, you know, depending upon when you graduate and pass the bar determines what that number is. But, and when you, when you file an appearance with a court as an attorney, your identification number has to be affixed to the pleadings, to the appearance, but you yeah. could easily just make one up or pick one out of the bar journal. 
But in, in, in suits, let's talk about suits. And one of the things this high profile Harvard law firm does, and I love the characters, Harvey, you are like, you are Harvey to me. Because, oh God, let me tell you about Mike Nichols. Mike is, and when I say he's the smartest lawyer, lawyer I know you truly no. are. You author a number of books, you're a public speaker. I mean, there's so much you do, but in that in that show, the Harvard lawyers in that law firm, Pierce, Pearson, what you know, whatever it is, yeah, um, they go and steal clients like they're going to lunch from other law firms. So they'll yeah. not steal, but purge. They call it purging yeah. these big, big corporate clients. So talk about how unlikely and potentially unethical it is for any lawyer to approach a client of another lawyer who already has representation. In reality, what would happen? Yeah, I mean, if if you're representing a client on a case and that client reached out to me and said, hey, I'm thinking about going to another lawyer, would you talk to me? You know, really, I should give you a heads up and say, you know, your client called me, you know, do you, do you care if I meet with him or her? Uh, you're not supposed to do the converse, which is reach out to, you know, Todd Levitt should not reach out to Mike Nichols clients and say, you know, is Mike doing a good job for you? You want to come meet with me? That's a no, no. There's, there's a rule of ethics in, in our, in our code. It says can't interfere with the relationship between another lawyer and his client or her client. A, A client, an individual has every right to seek a second, third, fourth opinion. What we're referring to it is that, as, as you just said, as an attorney, if you approach, started approaching my clients and said, hey, you, you know, I'll, you need to think about hiring me. I mean, just randomly, that is an ethical violation and you could be grieved and disbarred for doing that, potentially. And I think that's yeah. across the board and in suits, Again, it's it's show business. And by the way, suits came out, I believe, in 2011. Right. And then in 2000, I think 19, Morgan, uh, Megan Megan Markle, who plays Rachel on the show, uh, she ends up marrying and meeting uh, Prince Harry during one of the seasons. So it's really interesting as you get further on the show how things progress with that those characters. But so that's something on the show you'll see Harvey going out, and we're not giving anything away on suits, but Harvey. You know, um, that the actor who plays Harvey uh, does such a great job. So does Lewis, you know, the actors in real life. But that's something they do, folks, often is I'm going to go after Harvey will say, I'm going to go after that client. I'm going to go after American Airlines. They need to hire me. So we both agree, show business. If you're a so, lawyer so, out there, yeah. do not yeah. do that. If you're in law school. Don't ever think about doing it. All right, let's talk about something else they do. It seems that these lawyers within the firm try to interfere and, and let's say you and I work together. I mean, we do work together as friends. Typically it's me asking you to consult. <laughs> it's, me. it's not the other way around. Full disclosure. I'm always texting you. Mike's in a trial. Todd, I'm in a trial right now, but Mike, can you <laughs> call me. I, I, I've got to do some, uh, an evidentiary hearing. Mike, can you just give me, you know, evidentiary rule, blah, blah. Mike will say, okay, hold on a second. And, and then all of a sudden, while you're bordering a jury, I'll get this huge sight. And I'm thinking, wow, how does he do it? How does he bordier a jury and still send his best friend, Todd Eleven, <laughs> from the law, you know, evidentiary <laughs> rules? But um, I would, if, if we work in the firm together, the clients belong to the firm. Yep. I'll be in, I may be assigned to a case. You may be assigned a case. We do not interfere in each other's. How would you describe that, Mike? Can you talk a little bit about that? How we would not interfere with each other? I mean, we work. Right. Up, it's all for the clients, not about us. Yeah, it's not supposed to be individual competition amongst the lawyers. It's supposed to be advancing the the client's best interest. The client's interest is superior to our own personal interest. Our interest, financial or otherwise, is subservient to the client's legal interest, and that happens on suits a lot. It probably does happen in real life a little bit. I mean, I, I was at a firm where I was not, you know, the head of the firm like I am now, where there was some backbiting going on, for sure. You know, there's always politics 
when you have humans involved, there's always politics. There's always emotions. I always tell people when they come to work at our firm, leave emotions out of it. You keep, you know, when you come to work, the client doesn't care what a bad morning you're having. If you got in a fight with, you know, your spouse, um, you know, you, you know, something happened. Otherwise, those clients expect you to have your game face on. Yeah, and they they leave, no emotions, and so does the judge. So, so a couple things. One, we both agree we love suits. Great. I, I, I'm, so bummed I've seen all nine seasons. Um, <laughs> you can rewatch it. What's that? You can rewatch it. I, I'm rewatching Breaking Bad for the 10th time. You know, <laughs> we're criminal Another, defense oh. lawyers. That's what we do. But, um, oh, deposition. So we, well, let me get to depositions in a moment. But on the show, we both agree that it's unethical to purge client from a, another attorney. The client can come to you unsolicited. You cannot solicit one, you're not supposed to solicit. I mean, there's it's a fine line when we talk about soliciting. You can advertise, you can promote now, you can do things online. Yeah. But solicitation, it was, I think decades ago, it was more of a serious offense. But you cannot purge someone else's client just randomly. And two, the infighting with lawyers, you know, over cases that belong to the firm. I think that's exaggerated. So let's talk about the third thing, which is forgot what that was and depositions i'll edit this out have you yeah i'll edit all this out have you seen the depositions yet on the show where they just show up with a camera and it's completely like that's there's where's the court reporter you know there's i don't know maybe i don't i'm not a civil lawyer but have yeah. you seen those on the show i, yet? I think i've seen that episode and yeah it's obviously completely bunk they do it they bring a camera and everyone's yeah. been deposed 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 all right Let's talk about depositions on the show. Everybody's getting subpoenaed for these depositions. They show up in a conference room. There's no court reporter. There's the attorney, the client, and a camera. Talk about what a deposition is, Mike. Yeah, that's not how it works. In a deposition, you send a notice to everybody who's involved, who's an interested party, and the witness and you say at this date and time at you know Todd Levitt's conference room, uh, the deposition of XYZ witness will be taken for all purposes under Michigan's court rules. A court reporter is there to record everything verbatim and, and transcribe it so that there's a transcript for purposes of resolving a dispute in the case or using a trial to impeach somebody, or if you have to use it because somebody dies and you use the deposition in, in place of their testimony, there is, there is a sub rule in that rule that lets you simply do a recording, um, but it's not an official transcript, but you, you can still preserve somebody's testimony that way. It's not used very often, nor should it be, I think. Um, but that scene in Suits where there's just, uh, I know the one you're talking about, a bunch of people have cameras and they're just competing with each other for the for the you know best angle or something i don't know what it, what it is it's ridiculous yeah. completely it's not good. the way it is right there's a lot a lot of things about suits that are accurate and obviously they can they must have had consulted because the storylines are brilliant how they resolve these legal matters these corporate takeovers yeah there's there there must be and i'll do some research for or part two three and four of uh attorney mike nichols and Todd Levitt here, uh, as you get further into the season, there has to be attorneys because so the way they resolve those cases is brilliant. Like, wow, how they think, how they come up with that? But the other thing on suits they do is, again, I don't want to give anything away, but there's a lot of crossing the line. And yeah. Things that I would, that I don't even conceptualize ever thinking about doing as a lawyer. And the, the last thing is, uh, uh, since you're only on season two, going to season three, is they have all these. Uh, conferences with judges. I've seen a couple episodes where one of the attorneys will approach the judge, just the attorney and the judge on the street. Talk about how you cannot do that. You talk about no. when there's a case going on, Mike. You cannot just show up to the judge's house, the country club, and have a conversation with that judge. Right. What is that called? That's called ex parte communication. It is not allowed. There are limited situations where a party can try to get a judge to give them relief 
or, you know, as we say, uh, grant a motion, but it's very limited and supposed to be limited. We had it, for example, where um, Brenda Tracy, the accuser of Mel Tucker at Michigan State, got an ex parte order to keep uh, Mel Tucker's attorneys from distributing um, text messages that she was involved in. Um, and it's supposed to be very, very, very um, unique and uh, just simply not done. And if you get an ex parte order, you have to you know, cite certain reasons why, like if I go and tell them ahead of time, some harm may happen to me or my interests that can't be fixed, irreversible harm, we call it. And then it's a limited uh, period of time that the relief stands, like 14 days, everybody gets to come in and the other side who is subject to the order in this situation, Mel Tucker's attorneys, for example, would be able to come in and say, whoa, 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 wait, this order is improper. Here's why you have to set it aside and let us, you know, continue on with what we were doing. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I have always specialized in criminal defense and I work alongside prosecutors fighting a good fight. I know not to approach a judge either in the courtroom, in the hallway, in your chambers, and have a conversation with that judge without right. the prosecutor being notified and present of that conversation. Now, in almost 30 years of practicing, maybe only once or twice did I ever have a judge ask me to approach the bench when the prosecutor left the courtroom and start and want to have a conversation about that ongoing case. And I walk away. I said, Judge, I, I made something up, you know, because I, just, I didn't think it was proper, right? You know, even though the judge was the one, you know, pushing forth that conversation, they know they should know better. But again, judges are human. That's why mm -hmm. things, decisions they make, get appealed and appealed and appealed. But so let's sum up: suits Mike Nichols, attorney at law. Um, great show. Do you love the show? I love the show. It's a great guilty pleasure. Come home after a hard day of work and, you know, you're going to make some dinner and have a glass of wine and turn it on and just kind of let your head decompress. Most lawyers I know, we don't watch law shows. Other than Better Call Saul you know, and Allie McBeal back in the day, the only yeah, law show we've back ever in the day. Watched, yeah, yeah. we deal with it all day, the last thing we want to do is right. sit there in front of a TV, you know, and nitpick the writers, you know, because as you get further into the suits, and they do a good job. Like I said, they have lawyers consulting, but there's things I'll say, there's no way, according to the rules of evidence, <laughs> you could do that. There's no <laughs> way. But again, I'm not being that critical. I'm enjoy I, I enjoyed it and knowing that it was enter entertainment. But as an attorney, I'm thinking, God, I busted my ass to get through undergrad, working two jobs. You know, I worked at a factory. I know what you did. We both, you know, waited tables, delivered pizzas. Yeah. And here's a guy on a TV show that gets to practice law, never even graduated. I don't want to give it away, but he never completed undergrad, never took the LSAT, didn't go to law school, right. didn't take the bar. And I'm thinking, he, the guy's brilliant on the show. The actor who plays Mike Ross is brilliant. Yeah. But anyhow, it's a great show. Uh, and we'll have a lot more to talk about on future episodes right here. And Mike, you can be heard on my radio show that, I mean, it should just be the, since I, I did it first, so it should be the Todd L. Mike Nichols. <laughs> no, it's the Todd L. Emmett Law Show. Come no, on. you're on it. You're my regular guest. You're my go-to guy. So we've done other videos together. I hope you know we've done another video, and we're going to do a lot more. So there, that's I can't wait for our next. Uh, our, what's I that? can't. I can't wait for our next uh, podcast. With there's so much going on right now in the law, both wow. with SCOTUS, the Michigan Supreme Court, and the uh, Congress and the state legislature, I saw Graham Filler, one of our local legislators, talk about um, the federal legalization of marijuana and what's got to happen before that happens. So there's just a lot, you know, we're in a very exciting time because I, I think marijuana should be legalized. That's my personal opinion. Um, but, but, you know, things are changing all the way around, not just in that arena, but in all sorts of arenas. And, um, we have a great fan who is putting up with my wife and a bunch of other uh, women for a horseback riding day today up in Tawas. Jay Green. Greeny. 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 Yeah. Great Marine. Yeah. Love, thank you to all our vets. We love our vets and all the families and those who have sacrificed so much. We love Green. Yeah. 
He's yeah. a great dude. I gotta I gotta give Greeny a big old hug. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, back to we'll definitely do some more shows. We did a show on Reefer Man, as people can catch on YouTube. We need to get rid of 280E, that big marijuana tax provision. But Mike, right. hey, how can people get a hold of you at Nichols Law Firm in East Lansing, Michigan? Um, I mean, a lot of a lot of this this video is seen all over the world, but for those that are how can people get a hold of you in the state of Michigan for representation, either for, from you, other attorneys at Nichols Law Firm, or the, the talented and the smarter one, Wendy Nichols. Yeah, right. I mean, the, the best way is our website, NicholsLawyers.com, or you can email Wendy. It's W.S. Nichols, which stand, stands for Wendy Schiller Nichols, W.S. Nichols at NicholsLaw.net. I'm at M. Nichols at NicholsLaw.net or NicholsLawyers.com. MichiganDYDefender.com, that gets you to me as well. And I keep my eye on it pretty constantly. I'll get right back to you. Just as important, your uh, skeleton cup is covering your Megan's Halloween uh, thing there. You probably can't. There you go. Great, great, great choice, Megan Nichols, on picking out. Is that going in front of your house, by the way? Uh, we got to find a spot for it, but, um, you know, uh, Morgan and I don't agree on everything, but, but we agreed on this guy as part of our plan going forward to replace scary skeleton guy. He's fantastic. Anyhow, with that, I'll put on my better call Todd glasses. And I'm <laughs> Mike, we are not just litigators. We are advocators. Folks, please subscribe, share, like. And we'll see, you'll see more of Mike and I on future episodes right here of the Todd L. Levitt Law Show YouTube version. Mike, doubt you later. Peace out.